now I'm off to find Martin Partington from GEA Farm Technologies, better known to most of us in its former guise as Westphalia, because he has one or two things to say about how we can improve the farm environment so that we get less cases of lameness. Now Martin, you talk of this figure of 172 for an average cost for, for a case of lameness, which I believe is about 38 pounds for extended calving interval, something like 73 pounds for lost production, and 61 pounds for actual culling of the animal. Is, is there any way we can stop that financial hemorrhage? Oh, most certainly. I think if we, if we look at all the figures independently, we've seen the Holstein cow come in and the calving patterns have become elongated but we have a figure to work to and we need to do that. Secondly, we're looking for loss of production, okay? And thirdly, we're looking at a culling figure which may seem low, but set over a certain amount of lactations, I reckon 61 pounds is right. What worries me is the culling rate um, and lo loss of production, really. I think we look at a figure of between 16 and 18 percent of cows leaving the British dairy herd because of lameness. Mm -hmm. I would say that it's a heck of a lot higher than that because when a cow is lame she won't breed and she's open to other environmental issues such as mastitis. So I would say that lameness is costing us a heck of a lot more than we actually anticipate. Now you, you talk about uh, improving the environment, now one of the main things is perhaps the cubicle design which obviously have been there for many years uh, and cows are supposed to be lying for about 14 hours a day I believe. Now, have we got that basic thing right yet? Definitely not. Definitely not. It's okay for me to preach um, about new buildings that we can actually put right, but the cows are still in eight foot, seven foot six long cubicles. We now know that the British animal is looking at around eight and a half foot long. Now, that might surprise some people, but because a cow lunges when it's, when it's got to get up, we're looking for a space of around 11 feet. I'm not saying the cubicle needs to be 11 foot long, but the animal needs 11 foot of space to actually get herself going and up comfortably. And, and not just the bed, but you talk about the heel stone, that, that being possibly too high and that could be have a, a, a deleterious effect. Traditionally, uh, when people ask me about heel depth, I always say it's usually the size of a sleeper. We've used that because it's traditional, they're easy to put in and we can make the beds from that. A sleeper is too high. The first thing that a farmer uses a sleeper for, if you ask him, is it's so that when he's actually scraping out the manure, it doesn't ride up on the bed. We've got to get over that. If a cow stands on the back of those and actually slips, it bruises and you can cause a hemorrhage. We've all seen cows slip off the back of the cubicle, especially if they're not big enough. Now, another point you raised in your talk was about the feeding area and, and the space in building. Um, now, often that's not enough for the cows we're putting in these days. Yeah, you're right, Peter. Well, the problem we have is that we put the cows out, we let them hopefully have a feed. We don't really know how much space they actually need. Now, there are some industry guidelines. We're looking at about 0.8 of a metre for an animal to actually feed at a feed face. What we forget is, what we've just said, a cow's eight and a half foot long, and a lot of these passageways are only nine foot, nine and a half foot. The cows at the back, can't, they don't like to pass other cows. And, and that bullying bit where they pirouette on the back feet or whatever is akin to when they're leaving the parlour when they're turning sharp corners as well. They put a lot of strain on those back claws, don't they? We've seen, uh, certainly with older housing, that people have decided that it's not good enough. We've seen people put rubber matting down. Right? And what this does is it allows the feet and the cleats to move independently. It allows them to move uh, so th there is no ripping effect again in between the two cleats which again will bring into digital and interdigital uh, dermatitis. We've got to make sure if we put these surfaces down we keep them clean. And one of the final th things you referred to which just took me by surprise I must admit was, was a warning to people bringing sheep on for overwintering. Just tell me about that. I think we've got to remember now and look at the, di the disease of digital and interdigital dermatitis. The work that's done, we're now quite confident that if you've got dermatitis or interdigital dermatitis, it's probably been brought onto the farm. It could have been brought in by a boarding cow, it could have been brought in by yourself on your wellies, but we do know now that it doesn't live in the digestive tract, uh, it, it's found in the feet and in the slurry. 
And some interesting work that was done by Dr. Carter at the Vet College at Liverpool is that it is the same or very, very closely linked with foot rot in sheep. So if you are having sheep on, make sure you have a foot bath regime, a rotation uh, system in place. I'm not saying don't bring sheep onto the place, but again, a lot of sheep on day farms come on, they're not foot bathed. They're just there to eat what's left. Again, they need to have a foot bathing regime to keep the dermatitis and digital dermatitis or foot rot down to a minimum. All right. Thanks very much, Martin. Thank you very much.